Hey, welcome back to Geek Toolkit. I'm Joe Farrow and I am super excited about this video because I've been working on it really, really hard. It's not the video per se, it's what you see behind me. This software is something I call Dynaframe 2. The 2 denotes that it's a sequel to something I did a year ago, and if you've been following my channel for a while, you might have seen that video. In that video, I built these things called Dynaframes, which are basically digital photo frames that do not only photos, but they actually do videos. They run on a Raspberry Pi, at least they did on the first one. In the second one, I've expanded the capabilities, what they can run on. I've added a ton of features. And in this video, I'm gonna go over the new features, talk about how to install them and create your own, and talk about where I'm gonna go with them in the near future. I want you to know that the feedback that you've given me on the first one really meant a lot to me, and that's why I worked so hard on these. So I hope you're really excited if you've been following this project because I've addressed so many feature requests and things that people have asked me to do and I'm really proud of how cool they came out. So right after the intro, we'll talk about how to get it installed and then we'll go right into the new features. Dynaframe are these dynamic picture frames that you see behind me. And what's cool about them is you can see that one there is actually showing a video. They can also show photos and they now support crossfading. The other thing is you can use any web browser to control them. So in this case, I'm gonna use a tablet, but they really could be done with anything that has a browser. It could be a PC, a Mac, a tablet, a phone, um, a Zune. I don't care if you have a browser, you can control these things. It pulls up a web page like this and the web page has buttons for each folder. One of the big features this has is what I call playlist support, which means that if you put photos into a folder, maybe your family photo folder, or maybe you put pictures in a folder for your movie posters for like when you want your room to be movie themed. If you're video gaming, you do video game things. If your family's coming over and they have like, you have a favorite picnic that you did or something, you can have those picnic photos show up. You can basically hit these buttons on here and control the frames to be whatever theme you want. That one there is, I believe, video game theme. This one right here is doing comic books. This thing's just doing random photos. All of that's possible with this. You get any playlist you want, you can do all photos and so on. So that's what Dynaframe is in, is in a nutshell. Videos, uh, photos, transitions, and a web UI to control it all. Now the thing about the web UI is this is also controllable over home automation. And so I've shown before how I use Home Assistant to actually control this. So if I launch Netflix, my movie posters show up. So Dynaframe supports that too. If you haven't seen the first video, you can go back and see all of the features. I've got almost all of them in this version. What we're gonna talk about now is the new features. Okay, let's talk about how to install this. It's very, very simple. But there are a couple things that we have to get through, and I'm going to go through this as if you've never installed a Raspberry Pi 4 OS before. If you have, don't worry, it'll just take a minute. We'll go through it really quick. You're going to want to go to raspberrypi.org, click on download. So we want to go down to here, Raspberry Pi OS. You'll see that there's a number of options here. Go ahead and decide on your download and download that. Next thing you're going to want to do is go to bellena.io slash etcher, and I'll have these links in the description. Go ahead and download that, and you'll get an XE that you're going to want to run through. We're gonna say flash from a file. Make sure you've inserted your micro SD card into a USB port. Here's the image file that we downloaded and I'll click open. We wanna select the micro USB card. Once you've selected that, you can go to select and then you just simply select flash. We'll start going through the process here of actually flashing the card. If everything worked, you should see a page like this. You can take the micro SD card out, plug it into your Raspberry Pi, and then we'll go into the next steps. Once you've got your Pi up and running, you can set up something like VNC to remotely configure it, or you can actually configure it on the Pi itself. So this is my Raspberry Pi, and there's a couple things we're going to do. If you need to turn on VNC, sudo raspy-config, and then you'll want to go down to interfacing options, and then the VNC one is P3, and basically turn that on. That will allow you to remotely control your Pi if you decide to do it that way. If you're doing it on the Pi, you can just ignore that part. The next thing that you're gonna wanna know is IF config. This will tell you the IP address of the Raspberry Pi. If you're gonna remote into it, that's handy. We're almost done, believe it or not. This is actually, a, like I said, a very simple setup. All right, the next thing I wanna do is send some pictures. So if you right click at the top of a VNC window and say transfer files, you can say send files and you'll get a file browser window. And then you can select some photos or just in send an entire folder, 
folder over. Now this is using VNC. If you're doing it from the Pi, then you can plug in a thumb drive. You can browse however you want to do it. But basically you want to get some photos on this to get things going here. Copy them into your pictures folder. And then I can just drop that into my pictures folders. In the description of this video or up on the GitHub page, grab this command here and put it into the console window. Once you start that, the installation will begin. Now, what this will do is this will pull down the script, execute it. It will execute it using administration privileges. That's what the super super user do, sudo is. And then when it pulls it down, it will run install sh, which will configure a bunch of things for you. And then at the end here, it's going to reboot. If you don't want it to reboot automatically, delete this last part. I'm going to hit enter, and you'll see it's going to go out to the GitHub, the GitHub repository, pull the code down. Now it's extracting the code. The code comes down as a zip file. So now it's extracted. It's cleaning up the zip file and anything else. And now when you see this on VNC, it's rebooting. If you're on that Raspberry Pi, it'll actually turn off at this point. What you're seeing now is the URL for setting this up. This is on first launch on reboot. It immediately gets into it. So we can actually go to that URL. You'll end up with a page like this. I'm working on getting this prettier. If there's any web designers out there that want to help me out, let me know. Uh, otherwise, I'll just go through Fiverr or something. But I'm going to turn on Shuffle. I'm going to turn on the time. And I'm going to say I want it to change every three seconds. And I want it to take a second to change. And then I'm going to submit that. And that is it. So now every three seconds, we should get a new photo here. And the transitions are every second. Now, I'm actually using VNC to view this. So it's not going to look as good as it does on the screen. The other thing is this is a Raspberry Pi 3. This does run on a Raspberry Pi 3 and 4. It runs very smooth on a 4. On a 3, if you want to smooth it out, you have to change the transition time. So if I change this to uh, maybe 10 seconds, so just multiply everything by 1,000, and if I say every 30 seconds I want it to change, I will get a much, much smoother transition. In the rest of this video, when you look in the background, most of the videos that are transferring or transitioning are actually on a 30 second transition. Okay, now we get to talk about the features. Hopefully that you're really impressed with that install system because I worked really, really hard to make this super easy. I've seen people say things that were easy before and it was about 15 or 16 different command lines you had to run. So that was as easy as I could make it. The first thing I'm gonna talk about is the crossfades. The crossfades that you see on the screens that are happening are adjustable and customizable. I added crossfades in because it was very jarring. In the first one, it kind of would show a picture and it would disappear. The reason that happened is basically the way I, the first one worked is it would show a picture and then it would kill that application and the picture would disappear. And that's why a lot of people would ask me, well, why didn't you use this or that? I just couldn't. The way it worked, it wasn't designed that way. This is an entire rewrite to make sure that we can do proper fade transitions and that we actually have layering. So it actually shows the first photo and the second one appears behind it. And then the first one's opacity changes to get that beautiful crossfade. The speed that that happens is all adjustable and I'll talk about that in the settings section. But for now, that's what gets you these crossfades that you'll be able to witness behind me. Another feature of just Dynaframe in general is videos. And so you'll see every now and then a video pop up behind me or especially on these outer ones, they have videos loaded up on them. Those videos are just files that are in there with the photos. And the reason I did that is there's two things that I really got fascinated by. One is called a plotograph and one's called a cinemagraph. One of those is when you take a video and you take the parts that move and you stop them so that only certain parts move. Most photo frames that are Raspberry Pi powered would not be able to show this picture here. This is a demonstration of a cinemagraph where the fire has been animated, but the rest of the picture has been frozen still. The other one is the opposite, where you take something that is an image and you can actually animate it. So you can make like hair move or you make water ripples. Uh, you see a lot of water effects with that. I've discovered that taking that to some of the fan art that I love and animating fire and stuff is really, really cool. Also animating hair as if it's moving in the wind can give life to a picture that really didn't move before. Finally, the other thing I found these good for is Halloween. Halloween, if you go to like Atmos Effects, they actually sell artwork and videos that are designed to show up on things like this to make it look like there's just photos on the wall and as somebody walks by, they'll move or, you know, they can do scare effects. So there's a lot of cool things you can do with this. Next feature I'm gonna talk about is it's full screen. 
I won't go into it too much, but let me just say the first one was not full screen. And that's why you used to have to do things like edit your start menu and hide it and stuff like that, or change your background. You don't have to do that anymore. You launch these, they'll launch full screen, they'll hide your start menu for you, and they'll just appear beautiful and filling the frame. Another feature I wanna talk about is persistent settings. Uh, the first one had no settings at all. And if it did, they sure as heck did not persist. In this one, a persistent setting means that if you set the slideshow time, if you want it to be a minute between pictures, or if you want it to be 30 minutes, and you set that, then that setting will persist. It will be there, and if you turn it off, turn it back on, it will still be there. One of the things about Dynaframe is it works really well horizontally, I'm sorry, horizontally, and it works really well vertically. The old version, you had to basically rotate the entire Linux OS to get it to support that. The new version, you don't have to do that anymore. It supports full rotation across every 90 degree segment. If you want to do, if you have like a monitor mounted upside down for some reason, or if you rotate it left, right, it doesn't matter. It will support 90, 180, 270, and then zero degree rotation. And it will support that in the application and it will persist it so that if you unplug it and plug it back in, it will remember where it needs to be. So it's very, very simple to do rotation now. Another thing that's supported very simply is all photos. Before you could only do the playlist, so you can only do the folder. You can actually do all photos in your library now. Very simple feature, but I got it in there along with shuffling. So not only can you do a playlist, but you can actually shuffle the playlist now. Before it would only do the or photos in order. You can choose to shuffle or not. Not shuffling is kind of cool because sometimes you want your transitions or you want your look to be a certain way or a progression. But shuffling is cool too if you just get bored of the same photos going over and over. And again, that will persist. If you set that setting, unplug it, plug it back in, it will still be set. Another thing I did is scaling. If you have an image that doesn't take up the full screen, it will actually scale it to fill the full screen. That works really well as long as you match your aspect ratios. The aspect ratio means if the photo is wider than it is high, then you want it on a horizontal screen. If the photo is taller than it is wide, then you want it on a vertical screen. If you put a vertical image on a horizontal screen, then Dynaframe will try to fill the screen. It will make it as wide as the screen and it will cut quite a bit off the top and bottom. So just keep that in mind with your artwork. The download size has shrunk down considerably. You saw that when it did the setup, but I wanted to call it out as a feature. The first one was like a 13 gig download and you had to expand it out to like a 30 gig image and then image the entire thing. I've made this as small as possible. This means that if you already have a Linux or Raspbian set up and you want to try this out, you can run the one command and have it pull down and everything will be up and running very, very quickly. I believe it's a 28 meg download and it expands out to about 68 megs right now. I don't expect that to get much bigger over the next uh, couple of revisions. Part of the setup was the auto start setup. The auto start setup is a very simple way to get things to start up in Raspbian. And if you look at the install sh script, it will show you how that is set up. The big deal about that is the first one, the reason I released an image is there was all of these settings in the OS I had to do. And this one, they're actually done in the script for you to actually configure your OS to do the correct thing. Keep that in mind though, if you do install this, you're gonna wanna reverse those steps to uninstall it. I will try to make an uninstall script as soon as I can to make that easier if somebody wants to take this off their system. But if it is on the system and you reboot, every time it's gonna to try to start it up again. Another new feature is the My Pictures folder. Put your photos in the Pictures folder in Linux or the My Pictures folder if you're running this in Windows and it will just work. The nice thing about that is it allows you to upgrade the, the application without having to redo your photos or worrying about losing them. Like you, you're not gonna basically delete the Dynaframe folder and worry about any of your photos going away. And I thought that was really handy. If you know how to set up our clone, you can set up our clone to clone things to your My Pictures folder and then you can pull out cloud storage and use something like OneDrive or Dropbox or Google Drive to manage your photos. I'll go over that in a future video and I'm gonna actually try to add the setup to that into Dynaframe to make it a bit easier for you because I do think that's a really cool scenario. One of the features I am super excited about is the slideshow times are now customizable without having to edit code. <laughs> um, some of these I'm saying, and you're probably like, why didn't you just do that the first time? And I, I get it, um, but they're in there now. So you can actually bring up the web UI and you can set how many seconds you want between pictures. More importantly, you can set how long the transition fade in and out takes. And so that's the two times that you can affect right now. Now, the reason that's a big deal is if you've seen these fades and they look really smooth, it's because they're about a 30 second fade. 
I learned this researching the Pi 3D. I was going to use the Python Pi 3D library when I was rewriting this. And that's actually what Dynaframe 2 initially was. One of the things I learned about is this beautiful 30 second fade effect. If you do that, it's almost like a work of art as they go in between. And hopefully you've been able to watch behind me and see these happen in real time. The thing about that is um, if you want a faster fade, you can actually change that fade effect separate from the slideshow time. So you can say, I wanna show the image for five seconds and then every one second, I want that fade to only take a second. You can adjust those separately and it will persist again if you reboot, which is kind of handy. Two more quick things I wanna mention. One is file type support. The file types for videos have been expanded quite a bit. If there's a file type that it doesn't support right now that you need supported, let me know. If OMX player supports it for videos, I can get it in there. For photos, I'm using .NET Core with a framework called Avalonia on top of it. So as long as I can support it there, then I can do it for images as well. Right now, I believe it has all the standard JPEG uh, bitmap and PNGs. Another quick feature I added was a clock. And I think on this one, it's got supported. It doesn't show up over the videos, unfortunately, but it does show up on images. The clock is important because it's something that can be turned on and off via the web UI, but it also allows me to turn on and off text. And in the future, I can do other stuff with that. For instance, I might add weather or RSS feeds or whatever features uh, the community and I decide would be cool to add. But you can see it there in the lower, my right, your left, uh, that's a clock. The font size on that clock is adjustable via the web UI. Turning it on and off is also adjustable. And if you turn it off, the very next picture, the, the setting will take effect. Matter of fact, that's something I should just mention. If you turn something on or off in the web UI, it's always the next photo is where it takes effect. So if you change like the transition duration, that will probably take effect on the next photo, not the one you're on. There's a bunch of other fixes. There's things like file file names. In the first one, there was all this weird stuff that you had to have everything named a certain way and you can have underscores and dashes. All of that stuff, as far as I can tell, has been fixed. And if not, let me know, but it's a lot easier to fix it now with this version. This is built on what's called .NET Core and Avalonia. I wanna say that for the programmers out there. This is on, on GitHub, it's open sourced. Um, I believe it's under the MIT license so anyone can go play with it and do whatever they want. You can fork the code. Uh, if you have pull requests, put them in there, let me know, and I will uh, take a look at them. We'll try to make this better as a community. I am very excited about this, and I have some really, really cool stuff I want to do in the near future. You know, this is my arcade setup, and I think it would be very cool to have these integrated with the arcade setup so that when the arcade setup's going, it shows game artwork, or maybe it shows bezel artwork or something like that. Uh, maybe it shows me the map on Zelda so I can actually figure out where I'm going. I don't know. I just think that there's this cool auxiliary uh, frame concept. Another thing I'd like to do with it is look at things like hosting browser sessions because then you can do things like weather reports or weather maps or security camera feeds and stuff like that. I'm looking into these. I don't know if I'll be able to implement them, but if I can, I will. This one right here is actually running on Windows inside of this um, arcade setup. Again, if you've seen this arcade setup, then you know that I'm actually running a full Windows PC inside of here. That was in the pedestal video for how I set that up if you're interested. But it does show that this runs fine on Windows as well. And it's the same code base, which is really exciting for me. That means that we have a lot more flexibility as a community on what we're choosing to use with it. I am trying to run it on Mac OS X. I just don't have a Mac to test it on. So if you have a Mac and want to test it, I can get you a drop to try out. Let me know if it works. I want to thank you for watching this video and hopefully you're as excited about this project as I am. I'm going to release a couple of other videos. The videos that you've seen, like the video that's showing you there, that, that, that was perfect, good timing. Um, I'm going to show you how to make that uh, using an app called Warble on iOS, and then also I'll show you plotographs. There's apps on basically Windows and Android uh, that I've seen for animating images and uh, also animating videos in a way of doing cinemagraphs, so we can go over all that. Thank you for watching this video. I really appreciate the support and the kind comments. The first video of this had like 20,000 views or something, um, and a ton of engagement. There's engagement on the Instructables video or the Instructable I did on it. So I'm really hoping to build a community around this project and really expand upon it. And just really thankful to have your support. So we'll get a couple more videos out on this project and then I'm gonna get back into uh, home automation. We'll integrate that into this project because there's some really cool home automation scenarios. And then we'll get back into some Home Assistant and 3D printing. So. Thanks for watching. I'm Joe Farrow with Geek Toolkit, and until next time.